Well, welcome to the next lecture. I'll continue through the uh, great heroes of the missionary faith. And uh, this will be a little bit shorter than the last one. I'll try not to uh, embellish quite so much. But uh, we're going to go through, I believe, eight more uh, famous key missionary, missionary couples. Uh, and we're picking back up, born around the, uh, the turn of the uh, beginning of the 1800s, 1795, was born Robert Moffat sometimes called the Patriarch of South African Missions, uh, also well known as the father of all David Livingston, uh, whom I'll speak in just a minute. But uh, Moffat had a significant impact uh, upon missions in Africa, especially for more than half a century. Uh, he was born in Scotland, and he was raised by pious Presbyterian parents. Uh, he became a gardener and a landscaper, and he moved to Cheshire, England, in 1814, and there he started attending a Methodist church. Uh, he applied to the London Missionary Society, but was turned down. And so he worked hard and actually worked under the direction of the, uh, the director of the society for about a year. And then he reapplied and he gained appointment. Uh, though wanting to go as a, a married man, he was single and uh, decided he needed to be faithful. Uh, he did have a, a fiance, but her father, uh, was not very open to, uh, to her going uh, originally, but uh, three years later relented and allowed her for Mary to go and to join him. Uh, he struggled as he arrived in Africa, as he saw the uh, expatriate community, the other foreigners that were there, and even when he looked at missionaries from other organizations and their lifestyle being intemperate, sometimes immodest or even immoral. And so uh, he struggled with that. Also, it made him think that uh, almost all the missionaries, and this was the history up to that time, not just there, but in Asia, to settle on the coast because that was the easiest place. There were more amenities. It was easier to, to arrive into the port cities. And so he began to look at moving inland. And so he received permission from his organization and traveled several hundred miles north of Cape Town and settled in the region of Namakoland, uh, present-day Namibia. He invested two years in learning uh, the language and also invested in the leaders, the, the tribal leaders. One whose name was Afrikaner. Uh, he was once a very feared Hottentot chief uh, who had heard the gospel from Dutch missionaries previously, but had never uh, placed his faith in Christ. Well, under Moffat's influence, he did become a follower and actually became like the poster child and would travel with Moffat, uh, especially uh, among Brits and Americans to, uh, and he would show that an African can come to faith. Uh, in late 1819, Robert and Mary Moffat were married there in Cape Town and uh, were together for 53 years, which is very unusual as you study the histories of how, how many missionaries actually buried uh, their wife or wives. Uh, they moved 600 miles north <coughs> near the, the current border of what's uh, Botswana and it was called Kurdaman. Uh, he struggled with the language uh, and decided to enter the bush for 11 weeks with a group of men and just immerse in the, in the culture and in the language. And uh, when he immersed, his language had improved quite a bit. He began translating uh, the Bible. And uh, again, interestingly, it took him 29 years to, uh, to finish the translation of the Bible into uh, their language. He baptized his first convert in uh, 1829, so again, about after 10 years in country. Uh, the work was very hard and very slow to gain traction. Uh, they had 10 children, three died in infancy. Uh, after 53 years and just one furlough in Great Britain, the Moffats retired and returned to England. Uh, sadly, Mary died within just a few months uh, and traveled, and Robert traveled the next 13 years extensively, casting a vision for mission work, especially in, uh, in Africa. And uh, the city of Kurdaman, where they had planted their lives, became known as the fountain of Christianity in Africa. And I move on to the next uh, missionary because he was influenced in those 13 years as Moffat went preaching, and even before, he, uh, when he was out preaching, uh, David Livingston, heard about the work that was needed in Africa. 
And again, you may have heard the famous phrase, uh, Dr. Livingston, I presume, uh, that was actually spoken by a reporter from New York whose name was Henry Stanley, and it would be many years later uh, when Livingston was quite old that he would encounter Livingston there as, as he was trying to find him to, uh, to hook up, to travel, and to write a book. And so that's the same Dr. Livingston uh, of which I now speak. He uh, was born in Scotland. Uh, again, he, he was born into a pious, believing family. Uh, they were poor, uh, worked in a textile mill. Uh, and so he too worked in a textile mill as a young man, and yet he pursued education. Uh, he committed to be a missionary and uh, was preparing to go to China until he heard uh, Robert Moffat preach. And uh, then he heard Moffat speak of a thousand villages where no missionary had ever been. And that captured his imagination, and so he began to prepare to go. He literally followed Moffat's steps to Kudamon, and uh, later actually married Moffat's oldest daughter, uh, Mary. Uh, Livingston wrote of his journeys through uncharted Africa at that time, and because of that, he became a celebrity in England. Uh, he fathered five children, but unfortunately, he also was not a very good father. Uh, he put his family in peril uh, many different times uh, with many travels before find, finally sending them back to England. Now, at one time, they were actually apart for five years, and so an absent father for the most part. On his return trip to England in 1856, he was welcomed as a hero. Uh, he wrote his first book, Missionary Travels and Researches. Uh, his speeches motivated hundreds of missionaries to follow him, and new sending agencies actually organized uh, throughout England. Uh, he was not an organizer, and so sadly, a lot of things started, but really didn't continue to fruition. They did not last very long. Uh, he returned to Africa for two long expeditions, and it was on that last one that uh, Stanley fi finally found him uh, near Lake Tanganyika, uh, present-day Tanzania, and uh, spoke his famous greeting there. Uh, Livingston died on May 1st, 1873. Uh, his heart was buried there under the Mpundu tree uh, in what is today Zambia, and his body was taken to England. Uh, he was given full honors and was actually buried there in Westminster Abbey, and uh, again, as a hero uh, in England. Well, one of the most influential missionaries to, uh, to come out of the 19th century, his name was J. Hudson Taylor. And in fact, in Tucker's book, she writes, few missionaries in the 19th century since the Apostle Paul have had a wider vision and have carried out a more systematic plan of evangelizing a broad geographical area than did James Hudson Taylor. Uh, Taylor was born in Yorkshire, England, in uh, 1832 uh, into a Christian family. His father was a Methodist lay pastor. Uh, he shared the call to missions to China as a five-year-old boy and uh, actually came to faith at the age of 17. He and immediately pursued his studies, and at that time it would be in theology, but also in medicine, as most missionaries uh, had some type of at least basic medical preparation. Uh, he arrived in China and struggled mightily with Chinese, almost gave up. Uh, he wrote often of the impossibility of the language, and he asked for prayers on his behalf. Uh, he also struggled, as previous workers, with the carnality of other missionaries. Again, sad to see how some being away from their home countries reverted to, to bad practices. Uh, most of the missionaries lived in compounds uh, near each other for safety, for uh, fellowship, uh, and, and in the places where they lived, they were very luxurious compared to the way most of the Chinese lived. But finally, he was so frustrated, he moved out of the compound, rented a small Chinese home. He began to dress like the Chinese, he even had the, the, the black pigtail in his hair. Uh, well, of course, the other missionaries rejected him because he was really identifying far more than they ever wanted to. Uh, he was supported by the Chinese Evangelization Society, but the relationship was always strained. Uh, he was a very dominant personality, and, and after three years, they, uh, they severed ties. Uh, he was also unlucky in romance. He proposed twice to two different women and was rebuffed twice. Uh, he finally met uh, and married Maria Dyer, 
And she was the daughter of missionaries in China and was living there as a single school teacher. Again, Tucker recounts the, the interesting courtship that they had uh, and were married in 1858. Uh, two years later, they took a furlough to England to gain strength physically, to further his medical training, and uh, also to continue some of his translation and revision of the New Old New Testament. He also sought out another organization to provide him support because he'd already severed ties. Uh, he couldn't find one, so he founded one. He began what then was called the China Inland Mission. And he preached often calling the church to reach the many Chinese that lived in the interior of the country. And he repeated often, a million a month were dying without God. Well, the China Inland Mission, uh, in 1964, the name was changed to Overseas Missionary Fellowship, was like no previous missions sending agency. Uh, it targeted the working class and was independent. It was not under the umbrella of a given denomination or church. Uh, the leadership for the organization would be overseas. It would not be back at a home office. And so the Taylors returned in 1866 to China, accompanied by their four children and 15 recruits, other missionaries. Well, interestingly, even on the journey, dissension arose and Taylor had to intervene to restore harmony. Uh, as they arrived, they built uh, a compound where they would live close to each other. They were attacked by Chinese at times, sometimes barely escaping with their lives. Uh, other hardships, uh, they too lost a baby. And uh, Maria also died at the age of 33. Uh, he later remarried a single missionary named Jenny Falvin. Uh, Taylor had an amazing vision for the uh, size actually inhabited uh, the advance of the gospel. It said that the main purpose of the China Inland Mission was not to win converts or to build a Chinese church, but to spread a knowledge of the Christian gospel throughout the empire as quickly as might be. Or although Chinese assistants were employed, did it stress the recruiting of Chinese into the ministry? Uh, that's actually a quote by Kenneth Scott Lauderette. And so again, you see a vision for the gospel to be shared, but there was really no follow-through vision for disciples to be made and for churches to be started. And uh, so that, that was a huge weakness. And then what happened when the Boxer Rebellion, rebellion broke out? There was no great depth or roots. And then again, when the communists took over uh, again, there was that, that challenge. Uh, in June of 1900, an imperial decree ordered the death of all foreigners and the extermination of Christianity. And 135 missionaries and 53 missionary children were killed, were executed. Uh, Jenny died in Switzerland in 1904, and Hudson returned to China the next year, where he soon died. Uh, in 1914, the China Inland Mission was the largest foreign mission organization in the world, reaching its peak in 1934 with 1,368 missionaries and with a total of over 6,000 who had served under appointment. So again, a huge influence, especially in China. Let me just quickly touch on the last few. Uh, John Patton, uh, again, was influenced by the, the journeys of Captain Cook, even as uh, Carey had been. Also, Patton read the, the novels of Melville Stevenson, and later missioner, and captured his imagination for the idyllic South Seas. Uh, missionaries began arriving in the middle of the 19th century and faced many challenges, hardships. Uh, John Williams was clubbed to death on one island, which prompted a surge of missionaries to take his place. Uh, John Getty served in the New Hebrides. And uh, interestingly, there's a plaque that uh, was placed. It said, when he landed in 1848, there were no Christians here. When he left in 1872, there were no heathen. Uh, but the most well-known of all the missionaries to the South Seas would be John Patton. Uh, he was born in Dumfries, Scotland in 1824. His family was very poor. He actually had to quit school at the age of 12 to help his father's work, which was sewing stockings. Uh, they were faithful Presbyterians, and uh, Patton was converted. As a youth, soon began working in the Glasgow City Mission. Uh, after 10 years in Glasgow, he understood God's call to the South Seas and began a three-month preaching tour. Uh, while on the tour, he met his wife, uh, Mary Ann Robson, or May Ann Robson, and they soon set sail in 1858 for the island of Tama. Uh, the conditions were horrific, and Mary was often sick. She gave birth to a boy, but soon succumbed to the fever and, uh, and died. The, the 
for the boy died three weeks later. Patton wrote in his journal, but for Jesus I must have gone mad and died beside that lonely grave. Attacks increased and Patton nearly escaped death on several occasions. He took his gun and fled to a nearby ship for passage to Australia in 1862. While in Australia, he began to tell the stories of the needs that were on the many different islands, especially priests in the Presbyterian churches. He began to raise money. He raised $25,000, which was a huge sum at that time, and actually bought a mission ship, which he named the Dayspring. In 1863, he returned to Great Britain, where he continued preaching and raising money. He also remarried Margaret, and the next year they sailed to Australia and on to the New Hebrides. He learned the hard way not to mix missions and military might as he got called up in a controversy again, which Tucker recounts, as he was simply translating for the British, but because of that, had a difficult time overcoming uh, the people's attitude toward him as being part of that um, military might, far more than a gospel presentation. In the following decades, he helped to organize two orphanages, several churches, a training school uh, that raised up the, the next generation. And by 1900, all 30 of the inhabited islands had vibrant churches. Over 300 pastors had been trained, and over 20 missionaries had been sent out from one island to another. He traveled extensively, telling stories of the work and raising funds for new workers, and at the age of 80, he took his final trip to the islands. Uh, so again, very influential there in that part of the world. Well, Samuel Zimmer, uh, sometimes known as the Apostle to Islam. Uh, he was born in Michigan in 1867. His father was a Reformed uh, church pastor, and uh, several of Samuel's 14 siblings entered into the ministry as well as missions work. Uh, after seminary studies and basic medical training, uh, he along with his friend James Canteen applied with the Reformed Board to go to the Arab world, but they were turned down with the response that such a a mission would be impractical. Uh, basically, there was no use to go to the Arabs. Well, they formed their own mission uh, called the American Arabian Mission, and they began to raise support. But interestingly, the way they, they did it was Zimmer went west and Canteen went east, and they raised support for the other. So instead of asking money for themselves, they said, please give money so that my friend can go. And through that, they raised money. And... Uh, and were able to go. Interestingly, interestingly, Zimmer said that the biggest obstacle was the lethargy of the pastors in America, which again, sometimes even to this day, uh, that is discussed. Well, he arrived in Arabia in 1890, served as a single missionary for five years. Uh, he fell in love with a nurse from England, had to negotiate permission for her to wed, and in 1897, they went to the U.S. for a furlough, and uh, as a married couple and returned the following year. They moved to Bahrain, uh, which was 107 degrees uh, in the coolest place on the porch. Uh, by 1905, they had established four mission stations and seen their first generation of converts. And though small in number, the believers were bold and faithful. Uh, later that year, they returned to the States again to uh, increase awareness, to gather support. And he also became the first general missionary or the first secretary of the first general missionary conference on Islam that uh, convened in Cairo. Uh, soon after that, he became the traveling secretary, like the, the director of the student volunteer movement, and also the field secretary of the Reform Board of Foreign Missions. Interestingly, that had earlier refused his appointment to work among Arabs. So he was very much in demand. In 1912, he was asked to coordinate all the Presbyterian mission work among the Muslims. And uh, with that appointment, he relocated to Egypt, uh, where he led the work. He would often speak to crowds, uh, sometimes of 2,000 and more Muslims, because he was a great orator. Uh, he was often opposed. Uh, his greatest impact was that of a leader and an inspirational preacher. In his final years, he actually taught at Princeton and continued circulating uh, his magazine, The Muslim World, as it was entitled, and other articles. Throughout his life, he faced tragedy and hardship, like the death of two daughters and two wives, uh, as well as many close associates. But he remained positive and faith-filled to the end and left his mark on missions among Muslims. Well, the next one, sometimes called the patron saint of Southern Baptists, Lottie Moon. Uh, 
there's an offering every Christmas generally is taken up across the Southern Baptist Convention. Over a billion dollars has been brought in through the Lottie Moon Christmas offering since 1888. Uh, she was born Charlotte Diggs Moon in 1840 in Virginia. I've actually seen her uh, burial plot there outside of Richmond where she was laid to rest. Uh, her family was very pious with multiple missionaries. Out of her family, she was highly educated, self-assured, and uh, early on determined she wanted a life that counted. Well, her sister Edmonia uh, sailed for China in 1872, and uh, it was a year later that Lottie and Charlotte followed her. They began to work together. Uh, sadly, Edmonia was not uh, stable, uh, health-wise especially, and so uh, Lottie became her nursemaid basically for four years until Edmonia returned to the States after just four years uh, of service. This left Lottie Moon alone in the sense of without her, her sister. It was a dark time. Uh, it was a difficult time of adjustment. She was disappointed because being a lady, she was not given the opportunities that the men were given. And uh, she said that the misuse or underuse of women missionaries was the greatest folly of modern missions. Uh, so after 12 challenging years in a structure that almost suffocated her, she moved out to Ping Tu, where she enjoyed more freedom and was able to do more direct evangelism, which was her heart. She was often called the woman devil and had to slowly earn the trust of the people. She realized that she had to earn the men's respect before she could earn the women's. And uh, again, just the grace of God, one day three men approached her asking questions about the gospel and invited her to their nearby village. Uh, she found eager learners and an openness that she'd never seen before. And many believed and she helped establish a church in 1889 and that an ordained man, missionary, came and actually baptized the first converts. Well, from 1890 to 1912, she split the year each year between the evangelistic work in the villages, which really was where her heart was, but then also half a year her assignment was teaching and training work in Ting Chow. As she wrote many articles and once mused, it is odd that a million Baptists of the South can furnish only three men for all of China. In 1888, she called for women to pray, and to raise an offering of $2,000 to send two healthy women, $1,000 uh, each per year. Well, women actually prayed together, came together, and raised $3,000, and so they sent three women. Well, soon the Boxer Rebellion broke out, which led to a very sad state, mass starvation. A lot of women gave away almost all of her food and was slowly starving to death herself. She was very small, like 4'11", and... Uh, was losing her health because she felt she could not eat while others were doing it without. Finally, she was convinced to return to the States. And so in 1912, she was placed on a ship bound for the States. It made its way to Kobe Harbor in Japan. And there on Christmas Eve, she died. Uh, the epitaph that was written in the Foreign Mission Journal called her the best man among our missionaries. And uh, this year, the Lottie Moon Christmas offering goes about $155 million dollars. So uh, her name lives on, especially among Southern Baptists. Well, the final two. First, John R. Mott. Uh, now, technically speaking, even uh, Ruth Tucker pulls, brings this out that he wasn't a, a missionary in the sense of these others that we've talked about, but he was very influential in sending uh, actually thousands of going. He was born in 1865 in Iowa to a prosperous family converted in the Methodist youth group. At 16, he left for Upper Iowa University and there committed to Christian evangelism. He was one of the Mount Hermon 100 uh, that signed a pledge similar to the Princeton Pledge that surrendered to missions and actually helped launch what became the Student Volunteer Movement for Foreign Missions. And that this movement was officially organized in 1888 and not led it for more than 30 years. Uh, their slogan was the evangelization of the world in this generation. And, uh, and, my, and many took that very seriously. And uh, he knew that thousands of missionaries had to be mobilized and sent, and he worked tirelessly toward this goal. He also worked closely with the YMCA uh, at that time, which was actually a Christian organization. Dwight L. Moody, a famous evangelist, was one of the, the early influencers there. And uh, for over 40 years, he worked with him 16 years as general secretary. He traveled extensively and even saw hundreds of Chinese come to faith and, uh, and to be baptized. 
probably the highlight of his career was as a missionary statesman, uh, where at the Edinburgh Missionary Conference in 1910, uh, he was the organizer and actually the chair uh, that brought many together for the first time. Uh, the meeting lasted for 10 days, 1,355 delegates from many different denominations in different parts of the world came together for greater, greater cooperation between mission sending agencies. Uh, sadly, the decline of mainline churches in the U.S. and the uh, diversion of the social gospel uh, weakened this movement toward uh, world missions. And in his final years, he helped actually found the World Council of Churches. Well, lastly, Jim Elliott. Uh, and as I stated, Ruth Tucker shared stories of over 100, but I can only focus on, uh, on these 15. But uh, hopefully they've been a good cross-section. And uh, our final missionary, you may have heard of, Jim Elliott, his wife Elizabeth Elliott became uh, a very famous writer and author. Uh, her book, Through the Gates of Splendor, uh, was used by God to uh, prompt many to go to missions. In fact, more recent years, uh, a film was made, uh, The Tip of the Spear. And again, that tells a story, not just of Jim Elliott, but of four other missionaries who were killed in uh, the, the jungles of Ecuador in 1956. Uh, the five were Jim Elliott, Nate Saint, Roger Udarian, Pete Fleming, and Ed McCauley. And uh, they represent three different sending agencies. They work together to first engage the Alka Indians, is what they're called in the first book, or more accurately, the Karari tribe. Now, this tribe was known for its brutality. Uh, it had actually killed Employees with shell uh, workers in 1953, eight of them were killed as they were doing surveying work there. And so most missionaries avoided them. But these missionaries began mapping the area, flying with gifts lowered in a bucket, trying to build, uh, to build up a rapport. Uh, there was great secrecy because many agencies had said stay away from the, uh, the Alka, the Karari. But they continued. Uh, Jim Elliott wrote in his journal his famous statement, He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. And so ongoing contact uh, into late 1955, uh, on January 3rd, 1956, Nate Saint, who was the pilot, ferried the missionaries to a clearing near the river there, what they call Palm Beach. Uh, some positive interchanges happened that first day. A couple came out, they gave gifts. Uh, the following day, uh, very little happened, but then on the third day, uh, a war party came from the tribe very unexpectedly and just attacked uh, these five men and, uh, and killed them there on the spot. Uh, one tribesman later mentioned seeing a vision even as they were killing these missionaries, and the Lord used that as well as two of the, the widows, uh, the widows of Nate Saint and Jim Elliott, were invited to that tribe two years later, and they were able to share the gospel that their husbands had died for. Interestingly, Nate Saint's son, Steve, was five when his dad died. Uh, and later he went there as a missionary and lived among the Harari tribe. Fifteen amazing missionary stories. Uh, and I'm going to conclude this lecture by reading 27 names. And these are the missionaries under appointment with the Foreign Mission Board, now called the International Mission Board, with the Southern, Southern African Convention, who died a martyr's death. And I'm going to give you their names, the places, and the years. John Landrum Holmes served in China, was killed in 1861. John Wester was killed in Mexico, 1880. Rufus Gray, China, 1942. Dr. Bill Wallace, China, 1951. Paul and Nancy Potter, the Dominican Republic. 1971. Mavis Pate in Gaza, 1972. Gladys Hopewell in Taiwan, 1973. Archie Dunaway in Rhodesia, 1978. James Philpott in Mexico, 1985. Libby Center and her daughter Rachel in Liberia, 1986. Marianna Gilbert in China, 1990. Linda Bethay in Kenya, 1991. Chu Han in Kiev in Russia, 19. Charles Hood in Columbia, 1998. Bill Kane, Martha Myers, Kathleen Garrity in Yemen, 2002. Bill Hyde in the Philippines, also 
it was 2003. Larry and Jean Elliott, Karen Watson, David McDonald, am I right, 2004. Sid Mizell, Afghanistan, 2008. And Cheryl Harvey in Jordan, 2012. And so the legacy of missionary work continues not just by the International Mission Board, but by many. And so as you learn of missions through this course, it really is about faithfulness and how God can use all of his children to bring the gospel to the world.